that can hurt, that can either build up or tear down. We hear in the Gospel of John, the first verse, the Word was with God and the Word was God. Right? The Word is a very important concept for Christians in terms of what we speak is what we build is what we create. God created by saying, let there be light, and there was light because he spoke the words. What we say is incredibly powerful. So Jesus gets, just gets done teaching this lesson to his disciples who are a little thick about it themselves, don't quite get it, and yet he turns around, and as Leif again says so well, is a jerk. What are the words that he speaks to the Canaanite woman? Because she comes at him, the first thing she says to him are actually words out of the Psalms that would be very familiar to a Jew. She says to him, let me see if I can find it. Um, she says to him, <laughs> you know, it's never what I write my sermon, it's not necessarily what I preach. Uh, okay, mercy master son of David. Mercy, Master, Son of David, comes right out of the Psalms. She essentially comes to him with words that are familiar to him that he should recognize and would turn and pay attention to. Except he ignores her. Now, he hasn't said anything. He just ignores her. And the lovely disciples in the Gospel of Matthew, not much further along than in the Gospel of Mark, says the really nice words to each other, or and to Jesus, would you get rid of her? Really, she's a little irritating. I mean, she's bothering us, right? Just get rid of her. Remember, open arm Jesus, gathering all the people in. <laughs> Not so much. Um, so, oh, I'm back on my sermon, okay. I had to find my place. So she, so this is it, so she ignores him, so she now has to say and goes to him, um, and this is why I like this woman. She ignores her because uh, she's not Jewish, and the disciples follow suit. Okay, but she persists, and she um, continues to ex uh, clarify. You know what? I got to go back to the thing. All right. You know it all made sense last night when I was writing it. <laughs> How this all worked. Uh, okay. You, are you being willing, will, willfully stupid? Um, so what comes out of the mouth gets started in the heart. Okay, we already did that one, right? Okay. So Jesus is in order. The disciples complain. Now she's bothering us. She's driving us crazy, and Jesus refused. Now, this is the message translation that we read this morning, and the version that I read actually says that he doesn't say this to the disciples. He says this to her. I didn't come for you. I came for the lost sheep of Israel. Which he, what he's trying to say is, I came for my own people. I didn't come for one of you, the Canaanite. Not exactly the Jesus that we're used to. And what I like about her is she still persists. It's a woman I could be friends with. She throws herself in front of him physically, kneels before him. So he's got so many of the crowds around him, he's got no place to move. So she's a smart woman. She kneels in front of him and basically says, you're going to have to deal with me. <laughs> Right? I know. We like that kind of woman. You're going to have to deal with me. And she says, Master. Now, this is also important because she claims him as her Lord. She's not an Israelite. She's not a Jew. But she still claims her, him as her Lord and says, Master, help me. And again, oh, he gets nasty, right? It's not right to take the bread out of children's mouths and throw it to the dogs. He was a jerk. Leif, I like your title better. <laughs> you know what we call female dogs that breed? <laughs> he might as well have been calling her that. We do not give the food from the children and give it to the dogs. You're a dog. And yet... She still persists because she won't accept that answer. She won't accept it. She says, you're right, master. You're right. But even dogs eat the scraps from their master's table. 
Has that ever been you? Have you ever felt like the dog eating the scraps? That maybe sometimes when we talk about this big banquet feast that Jesus sets before us and lays out before us, doesn't necessarily always apply to us. That some, for whatever reason, we feel like we've not been invited to that table or we won't let ourselves go to that table. So the only thing we've got left are the scraps. And yet we survive. We survive even on the scraps. I like this story today because it's Jesus who changes. She got Jesus to change. She made Jesus realize, you know what? You're not living up to this whole Messiah thing. And you are called to something bigger. Something bigger. Because you've even bought into, and again, it's the Gospel of Matthew, you've bought into the fact that you think you just came for these people. And guess what? I'm here kneeling in front of you telling you, you came for me. You came for me. And I'm demanding, begging, pleading that you see me and that you hear me and that you heal my daughter. Now I hear, I don't have children of my own, that there is no greater love than parents have for their children, that they will lay down their lives for their children, that parents ache for their children, that when their children hurt, they wish they could take the pain for them. She's begging and pleading for her daughter and is willing to put her life on the line to get him to respond. This message is not just to Jesus, but it's to the Jews. This is not just about you. And I want us to think about all the different ways in our lives, because quite frankly, we all do it. I do it. You do it. That we create us and them. We and they. And we make boundaries around people. For whatever reason. It could be income, it could be color, it could be political reasons, right? It could be sexual orientation. We could run the gamut here, and I'm sure you guys could come up with more on our list of the reasons we make divisions between people. And yet, the gospel tells us today, it's for all of us. Now here's the kicker that I want to go back to. There's a reason why it takes this many times for Jesus to get it. Anybody think change is easy? Raise your hand. Anybody here like change? Love change? Just can't wait for change to happen tomorrow? Right? Want change to happen in your life? In the nation? Yeah. Amen. Congress? That's a different story. All right. We'll get to another sermon next year when I'm invited back. <laughs> There's a reason why change is even hard in Washington, and I'm not providing excuses for them. Change is hard for all of us. And here's what I don't necessarily understand. Why is it that when a new opportunity comes along, we reach for that which we already know? and we cling to it, sometimes with all of our heart and all of our strength, when there's something new sitting right in front of us, but we don't do it. And how many times do those new opportunities come around to us again and again and again? It's almost as if God keeps giving us chances. Now there's a nice idea. Even if we don't get it the first time, God keeps giving us chances again and again and again. So at some point in time, we have a choice to change. Because that opportunity had to come to Jesus at least three times for him to get it. So there's no shame in the fact that we have to be perfect, that we have to get things the first time around, that we have to just embrace change and love it, right? It's a process, it takes time. But why do we choose that which holds us back? 
I don't know. And I wish I could have an answer for you because I can tell you, I think, why questions are the hardest questions to answer. There's never an answer to the questions why. Nothing that ultimately satisfies. So let's just move to what would it take for us to actually let go? What would it take for us to try something new, life-giving, in front of us and make that change like Jesus did. Because here's the other kicker. He gives, her, he gives this woman a recognition that not even the disciples get. Now, I love that he says it's about her, but he's the one who made the change, right? But he says, woman! You ever, by the way, you ever notice she's never given a name in, in this story? I got an issue to pick with that one. With the... <laughs> Could we start giving women names, please, in the Gospels? That'd be if I had to write one, everybody gets a name. Now, there's arguments about why we could do that, so it could be general enough for everyone. But I love that. Woman! I know someone who hates when I say that. Woman! Woman! Great is your faith. Great is your faith. Because she wouldn't let go. Now, what's interesting in the Gospel of Mark... Jesus never says those words. Because, you know, that's the cranky, crusty Jesus. He just looks at her and says, your daughter's healed. <laughs> different gospel for a different audience. But he bestows on this outsider, this Canaanite woman, the utmost recognition, great is your faith. Great is your faith because you made me see that there's something different and that I have a choice here. So let me tell you a little bit about a change in front of me. Many of you may know that I was actually ordained a Lutheran in the Lutheran Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, back in 1995. Whoo, so long ago. It's hard to believe, actually, that I'm coming up on 15 years of ordination. I look young, I know. <laughs> Actually, I was really young. I was, um, when I graduated from seminary, I was 26. And I was a solo pastor of a congregation in far northern Chicago. Uh, and I was telling somebody that 26 years old. And you think, if you think I look young now, you should have seen me then. Um, they couldn't figure out what I was doing there, and I couldn't figure out what I was, what I was doing there either. So we were kind of uh, in the same boat together on that one. But I was 26 when I was ordained. And at the time... Um, I came out to myself and my sexual orientation in my second year of seminary. Which is kind of backwards, because people say, you know, when you come out in your orientation, it's always different for different people. But I, was, I already felt called by God to go into ministry. So let's just say in the Lutheran Church at that time, because they have changed, and I'm very proud of the Lutheran Church for how far they've come embracing change, even though they had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. <laughs> But there's no bitterness there. <laughs> they finally got there. I just wasn't with them anymore. So much so that um, I decided that these two things could exist together. I wasn't really sure how. But my orientation and my ordination existed together. And that was, uh, that was a hard road to live. In 2002, so I left, I came to uh, train to be a chaplain at Banner Good Samaritan, which is how I came to Phoenix. But in 2002, some of you know, and, the, and I don't want this to become about me, um, I was removed from the roster of the ELCA, meaning that they didn't recognize my ordination as being ordained in their church because of my sexuality and being in relationship with my partner. Let's just say that those words and I got a letter, were probably the most vile words I had ever heard in my life. They weren't foul, it wasn't foul language, but they were incredibly hurtful words. The power of words is amazing. So I didn't go to church anyway for years and years. And it wasn't until, well, I didn't think I was going to cry over this. Um, I actually was going to see a pastoral counselor. So it's a counselor who is, um, he was a pastor in the Methodist tradition, but he was a trained master's in counseling. 
And I wanted somebody who understood spirituality and my issues and not just with normal counseling issues. I don't, are, are they separate? I don't think so. But anyway, so I was talking to him and I was talking about how I was feeling about everything. And um, I'm going on and on and on about my hurt and my pain and my anger and my this and my that. And of course you can see when I talk, my hands fly. <laughs> and he said to me, stop. He goes, I want you to stop right now. He goes, just look at yourself. He goes, look at your body posture and look at your hands. Here's how I was sitting. And I looked down. And he said, now Kelly, your goal when you came to me was to figure out how to open up and accept light and life and something new. Is that right? You know, I hate when they use my words against me. <laughs> yeah, what's your point? <laughs> so when, he looked, he, when I looked at him, and I, he said, look down at your hands. And I said, yeah, I, I see him. Thanks for pointing it out. He said, Kelly, tell me how you can receive something new. How can you even hold anything new if your hands are closed? I hate when they're right. <laughs> and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And he asked me one question. Here's your homework. I hate when they give you homework. Here's your homework for the week. I want you to ask yourself, what will it take for you to open up your hands? Time's up. <laughs> I hate that too. <laughs> Really? Because now I'm a mess. I'm crying. My nose is... And i got to drive home. <coughs> so my point is, change is hard. Change is really hard. And it was probably that next week that I first came to First Congregation. Because I decided that I needed to come to some place to be fed. And I had to change. I had to be willing to trust again to open up, and I met all of you. And I can see the faces that I met on that first Sunday. And I sat here back in that, because I had to sit in the back, <laughs> back in that pew and cried for six months straight, every Sunday. Because here's what I got from you. Unconditional love, welcoming, and acceptance. That was hard for me to change because it was easier to hang on to what I knew. I was born and raised and baptized Lutheran, darn it. <laughs> I'm not going to be UCC. <laughs> I was a darn congregationalist. The best part was I had to translate all the nomenclature. I'm like, I'm used to bishops and synods and hierarchy and this, and like a conference. I'm like, what's that? <laughs> Do you have a bishop? No. What? Who makes the decisions? The congregations. What? Are you crazy? This is a top-down decision-making style. No, 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 it's not really. People confuse me. <laughs> so... Change is hard, and it's easier for us to always want to grasp on to what we know. Because the unknown, we can make up all kinds of stories about the unknown, can't we? And the what ifs, and the what could be, and what, you know. We convince ourselves of all kinds of things. But process theology says God keeps giving us chances. chances and opportunities and situations that come in front of us again and again and again. So no matter how thick maybe we are sometimes, like Jesus was in the story, we get it. That we have somebody sitting down in front of us right in our way who persists and says, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go. You're mine. Jesus and God, as the UCC says, which by the way I now love, we say that God is a still speaking God. And when God still speaks, those words come to us through other people who grab a hold of us 
who push us and pull us, maybe irritate the crap out of us <laughs> that we want to get rid of like the disciples did, right? But who persist long enough that won't let us go is the still speaking God who words come to us again and again to create something new. And that's what this story is about, is a new creation. A new creation. Because in this story, Jesus now created, in this one story of this tough woman, who I like to be friends with, said to the entire audience of Matthew, it's not just about you and yours. It's about me and mine too. And it's no longer you and me, we and they, it's us all together. So I'm going to challenge you today. I'm sure that in your own life, if you can think about it, there have been lots of opportunities that have come before you again and again and again. And this doesn't necessarily mean that it's about doing something more or taking on more work or any of that. But it's about being somebody different in this world. And God has presented that opportunity to you again and again and again. And because we're human, we like to hold on to what we know. So here's my challenge. I want you to think about what that is. See if you can let go and grab a hold on to that new thing, that new creation, that new life, and actually let it into your heart. Let it in. Let God into you. And here's my deal. I'll find out this week what it is that I need to do to have my ordination recognized in the UCC church. Because for over three or four years, I haven't done it. And you want to know why? Because I was too afraid. I'd have to trust again. I'd have to trust you again. I'd have to trust a church again. You guys are my opportunity every Sunday. Every Sunday I come here, I see you. And God calling to me through you. And I haven't done it. I'm ready. I'm ready. But I'm not going without you. Because <laughs> gosh darn it, if I have to be that darn persistent woman kneeling in front of you, getting your attention, we're doing this together, people. We are doing this together. God is calling all of us to something new, to something more life-giving individually, as a congregation, as a city, as a nation, as a society, there is so much that is possible if we're willing to reach out and take something new and quit holding on to the past, to what we know, to what we think is safe. So that's my deal. You can ask me about it next week. <laughs> you can hold me accountable. And you know what? I'm going to do the same to you. I'm just going to ask you, what's new in your life? And together, we can make a lot of change. Amen.